The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by John in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not assume, presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, and it is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Come on closer. I gotta, you got to see what happens when I open this Holy Bible. This Holy Bible. See, it says Holy Bible. All that happens... And all that I find is candy. What? All I find is candy. What a deal. Like I said, something is very, very wrong. Or very, very right. Because I like candy. Do you guys like candy? Yeah, yeah I thought you might. <laughs> A parade, yeah. We like parades too, don't we? Yeah. At parades we get lots of candy. Now I'm convinced that you all love candy as much as I do. Here, this isn't the candy though. Let me just set this right here. Yeah, let's leave that alone. Um, huh. So you're, you're right, Brody. I, this is an old Bible that the binder was loose on, so I took it out and I put the candy in there. Why might I do a silly thing like that? Any ideas? Because I am silly. That's right. And I maybe I was hiding my candy in here, huh? Because we know people are not going to come into the pastor's office and open the pastor's Bible, right? Ah, good place to hide it. But that's not why I did it. Sometimes when we open our Bibles... We think the only thing that we find are words of sweetness and goodness. And we do. We find those words. We find, we find words that are sweet to our ears and bring joy to our hearts, just like candy brings yummy stuff to our tummy and, and joy to our tongue. Jesus loves me. This I know. That's in the Bible, right? And those are sweet words. God loves you. With an everlasting love. Those are words of sweetness. But sometimes when we open the Bible, we hear what we might call bitter words. Words of judgment. And I talked about that last week. Words that we don't really want to hear. Like God saying, it, like God saying, repent and go a new direction. Go the direction of love because the direction that you're going isn't a good direction. When we hit our brother or sister, that's not a good direction, is it? So God says, "Turn." yeah, we do tend to do that all the time. So God says, turn around. God's word says, repent. Because the road you're on does not lead to life. It doesn't lead to blessing. And so sometimes when we open the Bible, we hear words that are 
that are hard to hear. And I bet your parents tell you some things from time to time that are hard to hear too, don't they? Straighten up. Tell your brother or sister you're sorry. Time to, time to buckle down and work hard. You're not doing your best. Those are all words that we don't sometimes want to hear. But our parents tell them to, to us because they love us. So the Jewish people, um, in what we call their Seder meal, a meal that they eat to remember uh, their journey with God, they actually ate bitter herbs. And they did that to remember their bitter suffering. But also I think they did it to remember that sometimes God's word, even though it's hard to hear, it's kind of bitter, even, even though that's true, that God speaks those words to us to help us grow. Right? And to help us love and to help us be a blessing that he wants us to be to each other. Right? So, let's pray about all this. It's a big topic. And I love the words of sweetness in the Bible. Because they give me life. But I also love those words that are hard to hear. Because they help me grow. And to become... Uh, to live a life that's more honorable to the God who loves me and created me. And the same is true for you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for telling us the truth about who we are, how we do good, and when we do bad. You do this to renew us. To set us on the right road. To help us on the way. And to help us bless others. With love. With grace. And mercy. All gifts. We have received. From you. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. This is the tension that we live in throughout life. On one hand, prepare the way. On the other hand, prepare the way of the Lord. When I hear the words prepare the way, I think of the many challenges that we face in life to move into and to meet the future that we are moving into, that we imagine for ourselves. Prepare the way. Prepare the way for the future that we have planned for ourselves. Get a good education, we're told, so that you can get a good job, so that you can make lots of money and buy a nice house, and one day in the not-so-distant future you can retire and live the good life. Prepare the way. As parents raise children, they seek to prepare the way for their children. They seek to open doors of opportunities for their children to walk through in their education, in their extracurricular activities, in their life in general, for social and uh, social development and educational development. All of those things, parents want to prepare the way for their children to open the doors to their children so that they can live and have a good life. As we think about this this uh, theme of the door, this Advent. We think about the door, I think about the door uh, where opportunity knocks. And we want to teach our children and we want to teach our grandchildren and, and we want to learn better ourselves that when opportunity knocks, open the door. Walk through it. Take advantage of it. We can either wait around for doors to open or we can work to push doors open for ourselves. But preparing the way. 
Preparing the way is about moving into and meeting the future. The future that we have planned for ourselves. It's about grabbing the future by the tail and pulling our way into it. When John the Baptist, however, says prepare the way of the Lord, his words have absolutely nothing to do with you or me or anyone else walking into a self-made future. Prepare the way of the Lord is a wake-up call from the prophet, a prophet of God, preparing us for a future that is coming to us, whether we're ready for it or not. A future that will one day crash in upon us, whether we're ready or not. You see, we are not moving into the future nearly as much as the future is moving into us. The future is coming to us. The God of the cosmos is bringing the, the future to us. And the question of Advent is, Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you prepared for God's future? Christmas is a celebration of the inbreaking of God's future in Jesus. God in the flesh coming to live among us. And his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension is a glimpse into that future. A future that is beyond death. A future that is beyond uh, suffering and, and sorrow and shame. When John says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, he sees, his fu- the, he sees this future coming. This future kingdom coming, being revealed, drawing near in, a very, in the very presence of Jesus. Jesus is God's missional agent who has come to repair this broken world, and more than that, to usher in a new world, a new reign, a reign from the future that brings healing and life and wholeness. In English, we call it peace, the candle that we lit today. In Arabic, it's called salam, and in Hebrew, it's called shalom. A season. A rain, a time of blessedness, wellness, wholeness, and goodness. The way life was created to be. That is the future that is coming upon us. The Lord is coming to us with and with him the future. And as he comes, John the baptizer, the prophet of God, reveals to us that God expects To find the kingdom already here among us. Jesus, the door says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, No one can serve two kingdoms. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but strive first for his kingdom. And his righteousness. And all these things. All these things will be given to you as well. Strive for the kingdom, Jesus says. Live it, enact it, and make it a reality in your midst. Now. Before the Son of Man comes, so that when he comes, he will see. He will see the fruit of your life. And your love. A life and a love that has been gifted to you by him as he gave his life and love for you. Now we know that this door goes both ways. Last week we read Revelation chapter 3 where Jesus, we're told that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And he promises that whoever opens the door to him, he will come in and eat with you and you with him and you will be one with him. This week... I want to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and following, where Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. 
Jesus is inviting you and me to knock on the door, to seek him, to find him, to to ask for what we need. For everyone who asks, Jesus says, receives, and everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. The future kingdom will come. It will come to you now, now, to live, so that you and I can live that kingdom now. Is there anyone among you, Jesus says, if your child asks for bread, will give them a stone? Or if a child asks for a fish, will give them a snake? If you then, who are evil, Jesus says, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more does your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? To prepare the way of the Lord, then, is to seek the kingdom of God, to ask for it, to seek it, to knock on its door, even as it comes to us and upon us without our asking, seeking, or knocking. To prepare the way of the Lord, then, is to live the values of God's coming future kingdom now. Repent and bear fruit worthy of repentance, John says, This means to set our minds on the kingdom, the kingdom values of God, the love, the forgiveness, the justice and righteousness for those who the world excludes and runs over, charity and goodness and kindness, inclusion and radical welcome, truth-telling and blessedness, values, values that lead to life. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about an unjust judge who grants justice to a lowly widow, but because he cared, not because he cared about God, nor about the widow, but because she kept pestering him. And at the end of that parable, Jesus says, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night, Jesus asks. Will he delay long in helping them? No, I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will Jesus find that the kingdom is already here when he comes? in the fullness of his glory? Will, in other words, God will grant justice to all who cry out to him, to all who knock on, his do- on God's door. But when Jesus returns, will he find a community of faith and faithfulness living into the values of his coming kingdom before it, before it fully arrives? Bear fruit worthy of repentance is a call to you and to me and to the whole church to live a life that reflects the values of the kingdom that is coming our way, that has been and is being ushered in in Jesus, a future that is coming whether we ask for it or not. Even now, John says, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. And these are, these are some of the words that we don't like to hear, some of the bitter words that we don't like to hear in Scripture. But the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. God's judgment is here not to destroy us, as I said last week, but to shake us loose and to open the door for us to live the future now in our homes, in our marriages, in our work and in our play, in every aspect of our life, to live lives of love and service to our neighbor. Jesus never wants us to build our confidence on ourselves or on our ancestry. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, Jesus says. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Actually, those are John's words through uh, speaking for God. For God is able to raise up stones 
as children of Abraham. Do not presume to say to yourselves, my grandfather helped build this church, or my my mother was baptized in this congregation. Everything and everyone who does not bear fruit will be cut down, Jesus says, and thrown into the fire. The faithful work of our ancestors and our and of our own generation is to point the next generation to Jesus. That is our work. To point the next generation to Jesus. To the truth, to the way, and to the life. If what we build is built only upon the foundation of this world, when the fire of judgment comes, poof, poof, it will all be burned up. We know all too well the seriousness of fire, don't we? Since November 16th, we've been hearing about the unimaginable tragedy faced by the John and Angela McClure family in Mason City as fire stole four boys from their lives. And our prayers go out for them. Fire is serious business. Fire is serious business that destroy, can destroy life in a moment. Parents and families, if you don't have a fire escape plan for your residents, I encourage you, I implore you to go home and make one today. When John the baptizer mentions the coming fire, he is not kidding around either. He too knows the destructive power of fire. In chapter 2 of Matthew's Gospel, we are told how Herod, in his fiery rage at being duped by the, the wise men who came to him and told him they would let him know where to find the child, the, the Messiah child, sent his army to kill every child two years and under as he tried to protect his earthly throne from this new king. This new king who was ushering in a new kingdom. The son of the Most High God. John knows the destruction fire can bring. He knows the suffering, the agony, and the pain that God, that, uh, of this world. And he knows. He knows a loving God who wants to turn us from from this world, from putting our trust in this world and to turn us towards His, His kingdom of love and mercy and grace. We can trust. We can trust that God. When fire destroys those we love, when harm comes to our children, we cry out, in our powerlessness. And we can trust that God is there. We can trust that God can and will build a blessed future for our children. That God will protect them even even in the ashes of our own powerlessness. Fire is nothing to mess around with, John says. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but Jesus will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And it it has already begun, John says. His winnowing fork, his separating fork is in his hands. To separate, to separate what lasts from that which doesn't. To separate that which is death-dealing from that which is life-giving. To separate that which is eternal from that which is temporal. To separate that which is heavenly from that which is earthly. If all we build our lives on, and all we build, uh, build our lives upon it is the door of opportunity in this world, one day it will all go up in smoke. Build your lives today upon Jesus, upon His kingdom values, upon the values of His coming future. In Romans chapter 15, from our readings today, verses 4 through 6, Paul writes, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures, 
we might have hope. So even when we hear the bitter words of God, the words that are meant to turn our lives around, Paul says we have hope. We have hope for a future because our future is held in God's hands. Paul goes on to say, May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you, that is the church, to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ, His values, His life-giving values, His life-transforming values, so that together we may with one voice glorify God and our God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Friends, this is where the future begins. Here in the church, in the body of Christ, living into the values of our coming kingdom. God's mission is to God's mission is to in God's time usher in the fullness of his glorious future to repair and to make new all that is broken in the world. And it starts here. It starts here with you and with me. It starts here with an open door. A door set open by Jesus, who has come to live with us and who has opened the door to the Father. It is not the door of opportunity that the world sets open for us, but it is the door of faithfulness, goodness, truth, and love. As we live out the values of Jesus that led him to give himself into death so that we would have life. This is where it all begins. These are the values that lead us, that lead us, uh, uh, these are the values that honor God and that lead us to peace, to salam, to shalom, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.